practical lesson. This one is called um, plotting mineral compositions. And to plot mineral compositions, we're going to be looking at pages 104 to 108 in the textbook. So let's go ahead and start this up. We're going to be calling this plotting mineral compositions. We've just learned how to calculate mineral formulas, so this is the, just the next tool to learn how to do it. And the next page is in the textbook as well. It's 104 to 108. That's 108. And really, when I say plotting, I'm talking about graphing. Okay, so we're going to be learning how to take chemical data, compositional data, and how to graph it in ways that... Um, are easy to visualize for some geologic process. Sometimes these are called discrimination diagrams. Discrimination diagrams. And what we're doing, what we're discriminating here, is we may be discriminating things like mineral names, right? We plot up the chemical compositions on a di diagram, and it allows us to figure out what the mineral name would be. Or maybe we plot it up on a geological discrimination diagram that lets us discriminate processes like tectonics by just having mineral formulas in their compositions. So processes like tectonics could be discriminated using mineral compositions. We do this using n-member composition. So I want to introduce that first. So the concept of an m end, sorry, end member composition is typically how this is done. And what I mean by that is this is the direct proportion of cations in a so solid solution. So the direct proportion of specific cations, let's add that in there, specific cations in a solid solution. And what I mean by that is what we would do is we would take like, this is the, the math here is pretty easy. We would just take cation A and we'll divide it by the sum of cation A plus cation B. Right? And if you do that math, what you do is you get like some percent that cation A is of the total mass of the cations. So a great example, building on the last lecture, would be the solid solution in olivine. The solid solution in olivine can either be N-member MgSi2, Mg2SiO4, or Fe2SiO4. And these have different names. They're both called olivine, but this one is called forsterite. And the iron end member is called phaolite. They occur in totally different geologic environments. If you had a pure end member forsterite, the symbology of that would be FO100. And if you had pure end member phaolite, it would be FA100. But what about when you have a solid solution? Well, we had actually a solid solution in the last um, lecture. We went through this example to calculate a mineral composition, and we ended up with Fe 0 0.87, Mn 0.01. Come on, glitch. There we go. It was glitching out on me. Sorry. Mg 1.14, Si 0 0.98, and oxygen 4, right? That's how, what we calculated last class. And if we were to break this down into our end members, well, we actually don't end up caring about silica. Whoops, let me try and grow. We don't care about silica. And in this example, we're not caring about manganese. Of course, we could care about it if we wanted to, but look how small of a number that is. It's essentially nothing. There is an end member of manganese. It's called a, boy, this is way, this is like deeper than graduate level, tephrite. Anyways, we're completely ignoring that. We're just dealing with the iron end member and the manganese magnesium end member. So the percent phaolite would be equal to 0 0.087 divided by 0 .0, 0 0.087 plus 1.14, which equals 43.5%, which we could write as Fa 43.5. The percent end member forced to write in that example would be 1.14 divided by 0 0.87 plus 
0.14, which equals 56.5%, which in our shorthand could be FO 56.5. Now those two better sum to 100, right? That's how the math of this is working. So reporting this solid solution, we do this all the time in, in geology, we could say that this mineral is equal to Fa 43.5, Fo 56.5. And of course this lecture now is about linear, about graphical plotting. And so this would allow us to introduce the first type of plotting, which is called bar diagram plotting or linear plotting. So let's just call it linear plotting. And in linear plotting, we just um, graph the end members of a solid solution. So end members of I, a solid solution. And it's just plotted along a line. So this example would be, um, draw the straightest line you can here, okay? Oh, that's not very straight for me. I bet you did better. We would plot along a line where this end is FO100. And right here, this would be FO0. So this would be FO50 right here in the middle, right? So find FO90. There, right? That's FO90. And where would our rock plot? Where our rock plot is at FO 56.5. So you go FO 50, FO 56, bingo. That's where our FO 56.5 would plot. But what about that phthalite 43.5? Well, it's in the exact same place because right here, if it's FO 0, it's FA 100. And FO 100 has to be FA 0. FO 50 is FA 50, right? It's just the opposite. So we need to find phthalite 43.5. Well, here's 50, we need to go below 50. Bingo, it's the same exact place. So you can work in either direction, which, whichever one's easiest for you to do linear plotting. Let me show you a real life example of this. Here's a diagram that you'll use in petrology class. This is an XY diagram. We use these XY diagrams all the time, and our linear plotting is right down here at the base, where we're plotting the composition of plagioclase between two end members. This one's called AB, or albite, AB100, which goes down to AB0 at the exact opposite end of the spectrum, where the other end of the solid solution is AN100, and down here would be AN0. So I tend to work a lot in Yellowstone, and in Yellowstone, there are crystals that have a composition of AB72, AN28. Now let's find where that would plot. AB72, so here's AB100, AB90, AB80, AB72 would be the location. Let's check if that's AN28 as well. It better be AN0, AN10, AN20. A and 28. Now the y-axis here ends up being temperature. And this is beyond the purpose of this class, but what you could do is you could take that composition and plot it up until you hit this line, and you're starting to learn about how the magma might start to melt in response to increasing temperature, right? That's what's being shown here on the, on the y-axis. But we don't need to learn about that right now, because that's for next semester probably. So to end this lecture, we need to introduce the idea of ternary plotting, where we have three different end members of a solid solution to work on. So this is called a ternary diagram. We use these all the time in the geosciences. All the different geosciences use ternary diagrams. And in a ternary diagram, there's a triangle. And each apex of that triangle, if you could draw this as an equilateral triangle, you'd be doing it the best. Each apex, all right, that means the corner of a triangle, each apex is equal to 100% of a solid solution. Solid solution. Each base, let's do that, each base of a triangle is equal to 0% of a solid solution. So in this example, here's an apex, 
we're going to have the solid solution just be A. At this point right here, it is A 100. And as we go down away from A towards the base in this direction, we have decreasing amounts of A. So up here, this would be like A 90, and anything along this line is A 90. And then if we go lower, further away, that's A 80, until we get all the way down here, where this line right here, across the whole base, is equal to A 0. But each corner is equal to something. So here, this would be apex B, and at this point right here, it is B 100. As you move away from that corner, we go to lower and lower amounts of B. So this is B 90, here's B 80, and we go down and down until we get to this line right here. That's the base of this triangle, right? Moving in this direction. This line here is equal to B 0. And if there's one more corner, this is C apex. So this corner is equal to C 100. As we go away from C 100 in this direction, we go to lower amounts of C. The base of the triangle is C 0. Where's C 50? Well, C 100, sorry, C 100, C 90, C 80. Keep going. So that's C 70. So C, C 50 is going to be this line perpendicular to the base in this direction. So let's put this into practice. I'm going to put in a real diagram. I'm going to give you two examples. We're almost done with this lecture. I wouldn't be shocked if you're getting a little confused here, but remember the textbook talks about us really well in pages 104 to 108. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to have, this is our A apex. Here is our B. Here is our C. You can go snag one of these pictures from the internet, just search blank ternary diagram, or just draw one of these. And what's really nice about this diagram is that it shows all the tick marks and lines. So this line right here is equal to A90. This line right here, what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to C10, right? Because here's C90, C80, C70, C60, blah, blah, blah. Here's C0, so that's C10. And in our first example, Okay, we've got all the colors in, good. We're going to go, where in the world is A, B, C, A, 50, B, 10, C, 40. Now, this needs to sum to 100. So if it doesn't sum to 100, we're doing something wrong. But the way we do this is we put in a line at A, 50. Boom. Then we put in a line at B, 10. B, 10, where's that? It's right here. And where all three of these lines intersect is where the answer is. C40. So C0, C10, C20, C30, boom, C40. And look at that. They all overlap in the same exact spot. We got the right answer. Uh, I better, let me, let me erase this. We'll do another example. Ready? We're going to do an example of A5, B35, C60. We could do this in any direction. I like working from A first. Well, A5, that's, this line right here is A10. So A5 is actually this line. Very low, very far down number. B35. B100, B90, B80, B da, 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 da. Here it is right here. And our third line is at C60. Let's see where C60 comes in. C90, C80, C70, C60, right there. They all over intersect at the same place. We'll finish our work with the ternary plotting diagram with a real example from Yellowstone Caldera. I spend a lot of time at Yellowstone working there as a petrologist. And one of the minerals we find in the rocks is a pyroxene. We don't know the name of the pyroxene until we've plotted it on a ternary diagram. The pyroxene at Yellowstone, when you analyze it with electron microprobe, has MgO at around 13%, and it has FeO in the minerals at around 46%, and calcium oxide at 41%. Now, if you go through the process and calculate it all out, these are the different solid solution end members, where Ca2Si2O6 would be equivalent to pure CaO. This is our pure MgO, and here's our pure FeO.
So we can take these compositions, plot them on the diagram to get a name. So to start off, let's go MGO at 13%. Well, here's MGO 100%, and MGO 13% is going to be somewhere along here, near the base of the MGO triangle. FEO is at 46. Well, 45 is right here as it was given away, so we're going to put in the FEO kind of coming in right around here. And our calcium, uh-oh, that was a mistake. Did you catch it? That's not 46 FEO. That's 46, I just put it in, at of the CAO. So let's go in. Sometimes mistakes are good for teaching, right? That was wrong. Now let's fix it. So for calcium in blue, we're at 41%. So it's actually just below that dashed line. I guess it's a solid line. I just put in a dashed line. And our FEO, put it in green, is actually measured in this direction. So 46 should be somewhere around here, giving us an answer. The name of this pyroxene is Augite.